Paddock is a training and exercise space for sport, education, and performance. Each week, we look to grow ideas and innovation through conversation from beautiful Auckland, New Zealand. Cool. Welcome to this week's On the Paddock with Daryl Parkin. Uh, thanks for, for hanging out at the paddock. Um, uh, Daryl Daryl is another senior lecturer at the, at the School of Sport at Manukau Institute of Technology. He has a master's in educational leadership, postgrads in health science and sports and leisure studies. Very, very keen on health promotion, outdoors education, and management and leadership. Um, I'm really happy to, um, to, to have Daz and all his experience. He's been with the School of Sport for a great amount of time, up around there about 18, 19 years, I believe. Um, he's our go-to man, um, great bloke, um, go-to man um, to actually get things across the line and, and, and just nut out some great ideas, especially around growing students and growing student leadership, which is gonna be our conversation today. Daryl, thanks so much for for coming around to the paddock and joining the conversation. How are you doing? I'm um, good, thank you, my friend. Good, good, and uh, hello to your viewers. Hey, yeah, um, did I get your intro right? Or or would you want to add something or tell us a little bit more about your background? Yeah, no, I think, no, I think it's, that sums it up, right? It's been, a, it's been a big journey. I've been here at MIT for about 19 years, and. Uh, and uh, been through through various roles in that time, but um, still the passion and the, the fire still burns, right? Otherwise, we wouldn't be in this space for, for as long as we have been. And um, yeah, no, I think it's about right. I've um, I've been uh, I've been through a number of courses of sport management and 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 you're right with sitting with the outdoor space and the leadership, and uh, that's kind of where I'm sitting at the moment. Hey, but you, I like that you said that there's a, that that passion and that drive that's still alive. Um, I mean, we're the, we're exactly the same age. Um, you look a lot younger than I am, and, and probably a lot jovial, a lot jovial. And I'm, and I'm putting this on live. Um, but what keeps that passion alive? What keeps that passion alive when we're involved in education and in sport education specifically, which is is our background? Well, it's always people, right? It, it's always people. It, like that, every year is different. Um, we get the same drive. You, you know, to, to be honest, Brian, when I was when I was young, like if I was to, you know, look all those years back and look and, and say that I've got my masters now, um, then I would have I would have laughed. Right? I, I would have kind of yeah, I, I would have cracked up and fallen off my chair because to to be honest, like education one wasn't anything else discussed in my household. Um, I went to a high school that didn't hugely appreciate, um, well, in my opinion, didn't hugely appreciate um, nurturing students to go on and uh, and excel. It was more uh, it was more of a drive to put you into trades rather than um, rather than getting into uh, higher honors. And, and we didn't see many people in my year and, and go on to university. There's a few, but not not a huge huge amount. Um, and um, and so, in, in the conversation around, to be honest, in the conversation around my household wasn't around education either as well. You know, it was more like, well, what are you going to get into? And it's expected that you're going to go into a trade or just, you know, as long as you stay out of trouble sort of thing. And so, so I left, I left high school pretty disenchanted by education, to be, to be fair. <laughs> like, very, very disenchanted. And I was like, it's not for me. I'd done one year at MIT and then failed. And then I was like, ah, oh, whatever. And I worked for a year in the supermarket and then... Uh, and then it was probably around the time where, um, and I'll never forget this conversation, my dad hands me a piece of paper and goes, here, apply for this. And it was a, it was a Camp America um, thing. I was 19 years old and he said, and it was literally his way of saying, get out of the house because I'm sick of you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it was, it was um, and, and I never remember, I forget the conversation, right? Because I, I ended up just going, well, I've got nothing else on the cards. I'm going to go for this. And then, I went to America, 19 years old, first time in San Francisco, looking around, first time out of the country, and uh, I was walking around there, backpacking on my own, and and um, and of course my parents were probably a little bit nervous, but but I, I got out there with you know a few hundred dollars in my back pocket and worked in the summer camp, and um, yeah, ended up staying there for four years, 
And and it wasn't until, you know, back and forth to New Zealand. And, and then it wasn't until later on, um, then I really appreciated his passion, really appreciated people and appreciated his passion. And so, and, and so, you know, back to, back to the, you know, why I stay in this job is because um, I, I probably see a lot of myself and a lot of our students, to be honest. Um, I see a lot of people who are very disengaged from, or have been disengaged from education because we know the school system doesn't work for everyone. And mm. we know that because we get a lot of these students through, um, through in, in many forms and shapes and forms, you know. So it's about trying to find what makes them tick is probably what, um, what really excites me about people. Um, trying to find out what um, what buttons to push, um, that light bulb moment, and you know all, all the educators talk about their light bulb moment, right? And you see the light bulb go off in the students, and the conversation come out from just a simple, simple. Um, sometimes you know I've done a huge amount of planning, and the conversation doesn't even go that way. But then I've done a little bit of thing about you ask the right question, or you ask that you know you push the right button, you can see the light bulbs going off in the students. And go, oh, that's cool. Yeah, and, I, 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 I suppose I, it's something we're trying to replicate. Yeah. Yeah, and that's actually really cool to, to hear. I, I, what I, I just wrote down something that you said because it's a conversation that I'm constantly involved with uh, with schools and, and young people is that in, back in your days, um, your school actually was pushing more kids to go into the trades and not necessarily education. And it continues to be um, a strong driver uh, in, in many educational environments for our young people, especially for our Pacifica and, and, and Maori students um, to just get pushed into that trades bucket um, you know, that's 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 a category that um, we're pushing our students into and not necessarily to achieve and or we're not we're not to achieve higher education um, in, in that traditional sort. Um, you experienced something similar. You were in an environment that, again, was also pushing that trade and not necessarily education. Looking back and, and like you say, we, we get to work with young people that might have a similar experience with education like what you had when you're in high school. What's that message? What's that message in regards to showing um, youth the possibilities that are out there and the possibilities, because I know a, a strong background and, and, and master's level study that you have is on educational leadership. What's that message for, uh, for youth in regards to the different pathways that exist, you know? It's not only trade, especially when you're so directed into just one direction. I mean, yeah, you're, you're in this type of school, you're this type of student, that's it. And actually, yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot yeah. more out there. Yeah, 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 no, there's plenty, plenty out there. I think, I think a lot more education's come a long way, right? Um, when I was doing my master's, I done this, um, my, my, my research took me into this, into it. I've always been interested in student leadership. And, and we're going to go, I know we're going to have a probably conversation around it later on, but um, since then, um, you know, when my research took me into the, the kind of space where, you know, students are now seen as customers, consumers, blah, blah, blah. So what that's led us into in terms of tertiary environment is that we're all competing for numbers now, right? We're competing between other polytechnics, we're competing against, against universities um, for numbers. And so, so what, that's, what that's led to is a space where now polytechnics and universities are going out to students and they're going out to exploit their, what they have to offer to, to students. Um, my, uh, and I think, so I think there's, there's plenty of opportunities for all schools um, that have been reached and touched by, you know, by the likes of social media, um, platform marketing, um, the, the student school representatives that go out to school, the liaisons, the career advisors in schools. Um, my, my advice is, is really to keep options open. You know, you know what I've done in the end? When I had, I left my school, in fact, I left my degree and I had no idea what I wanted to do. I had no clue, mm. no clue. And I, and I knew, but I knew it was around, and I, but I, I'd done an exercise when I was probably towards the end of my degree. Um, I might have even passed my degree. I'd done this training course and it was a, a one-day course and it was, a, it was about career definition. And, and one thing it got me to do, um, this program got me to do was um, just write down what I enjoy about work. Like what what, the, what what would my ideal career be? Okay, so I, I started writing down what I enjoyed about um, doing, you know, like what, what I would expect to say. And I, I wrote down things like, you know, I like working with people. I like working in a training environment. Um, I like kind of um, inspiring, being in a position to inspire, to lead people. 
Um, and then I wrote down on the other side, what, what don't you like doing? And I think the first thing on my list would be like office work, um, sitting at a desk, uh, too much computer work, paperwork, stuff like that. Um, and, and literally, in that moment, a light bulb went off, right? And we went, oh, right, cool. Because now I had a now I had a kit there full of traits where I, I wanted to go. So I, I literally took that and went, cool, which job fits this package? Yeah. You know, which job looks around this? So, you know, my recommendation to people who are looking for work and looking for a career and looking for inspiration um, for their careers is to maybe do a similar exercise, you know, like like just jot down what do you want to do? Like what, what are certain traits that you that you feel you might be more appropriate and kind of um, kind of uh, move you towards and then um, do the same thing with things that you don't and then it gives you a chance to move ahead with, you know, with the kit is full of, you know, just basic, um, basic words or, or factors or traits or even job descriptions that maybe that may suit you know and then because you have no idea you have no idea what's out there and and for me it was sport because sport ticked all the boxes I had no idea what I wanted to do in sport <laughs> no yeah. idea yeah. but the good thing about this industry right it's like it's got so many transferable skills that you can go from recreation so I started in aquatics and I went from aquatics uh, to recreation to fitness center um, and this is all in the space of me doing my degree. And I went, and I went, wow, wow. like these are all different roles, but they're all the same in many respects. Yeah, what, to, uh, what I find interesting as well is that it does also require a good level of maturity to sometimes look at what your true interests are uh, mm -hmm. and what you're really not interested in. So you can do that reflection process that you, you have the head chance to do. Do you, do you think, um, and, and I, I know that many times, um, older students are afraid to go back and study. Um, after, after you came back from the States and, and you went in to do your degree, do you think it helped going into being a bit older than the 18, 19 year old to go into study? 100%, 100%. I would never have survived the degree had I come straight out of school. I would never have a chance to survive school. Like I was literally, I was, it was literally my time, right? Like I, I, remember, I remember clear as day, I was sitting on the bank of this, uh, in, in the States and we were with a friend who was French and we we're just chilling out and, and then uh, it was like a light bulb moment, right? You know, I, I knew I was ready to study because I knew I had piece of experience. I just didn't have anything on paper and I knew I, I had more to offer. Um, right. Had I gone straight from school, uh, straight straight from school to work, then um, then it would've, I would have struggled. But that's, that's me and I know a lot of people can go straight from school to school and because it's a different kind of school, it's different kind of opportunities, but yeah. it's a, uh, um, for me, it just, I don't, I don't think of, I think that maturity just gave me time to reflect on what I was doing and it gave me that drive. Um, and uh, you, you find that with a lot of mature students that we teach now, um, Fran, and you, and you know, is that you, you know, that they seem to have more um, reflection tools. They may not be the most academically smartest students in class, but in terms of reflection, the assignments come off stronger because yeah. they have more kind of uh, world knowledge, world, world view. Um, but yeah, not, not I'm saying that it's not a necessarily a chronological thing. It's not necessarily because they're older, but they're more mature. So you can get, yeah. and we've had students that are younger that have also had that same world view because they've had the experiences outside, right? They've been in different environments that have kind of um, enhanced their, their learning in some other way, whether it be in outdoors or whether it be um, living in different country schools or um, whether it be, you know, different, just different environment or different household dynamics. And, and that, and that's really interesting. I mean, every student's different, uh, but it's, it's actually really good to, to hear how uh, for older students, the so students are in their mid-20s. Um, what, one of the chances I've had over the past few weeks is to touch, to touch base a lot with um, rugby players that they're in their mid-20s, late, late 20s, and thinking of whether I can study, am I too old to study, can I do it? And it's actually, um, it, it's something that they can do. And I think you've touched on the key word there, it's experience. Um, I mean, younger people, some, they're sometimes very in tune to study because that's what they've been doing. They want to study and it just fits, fits in perfectly well. But when you're older, it can fit in perfectly well because the experiences mm -hmm. are such an important factor to that that learning um, and to that reflective process that way that you've been talking about. Um, and I know that's a big part. That's a big part about your approach to um, to, to teaching and your approach to sport education, which is our, our field in the background, is about generating experiences. Um, 
how, how, how do you how would you explain the value of generating experiences through the process of learning um, for 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 either younger or older uh, tertiary students so they can actually become stronger at the end? So um, I think it comes down to well, my, my, my background, my interest, my, my interest, a real strong interest is in, in leadership, right? And it's, and, and, and it always has been, you know, it's always like, regardless of whether you see yourself as a leader or not, leadership is actually a huge component of, of learning because it's, what, what it requires you to do is step up and take a lead, okay? But not, not underestimating, um, the, you know, the people inside your, in your, inside your space as well, because it also requires people to also step up and kind of see you as a leader and, and kind of acknowledge that as well. But I, I think, and, and the thing is with, the, with leadership, um, leadership you can't learn in the classroom, you're guaranteed. Like you, you can learn about leadership in the classroom, but you can't learn leadership from sitting down what, listening to someone talk about leadership, right? Like you can, you know, you know what I mean? So, so you can learn to be a leader in, in that space. So um, experience is, is, is hugely important, you know, because it, it's going to, what it's going to get you to do, it's going to get you to learn one thing about yourself. And the second thing about others, you know, and, and, and third, it's going to probably teach you, it should teach you your, your limitations in, inside a certain space as well. So I, I think um, having the experience to, um, is, is a big, big important key factor in terms of learning to be because it's it's gonna it's gonna teach you about how you, how you can um, tackle situations, how you can address problems, how you can um, step up and be resilient, you know. And, and uh, because one thing we all know is that when you're studying something, you know, I'm I'm, I'm my second year studying to do. I've done my I've done my postgraduate or masters. I'm doing to do of my second year of my study. I'm struggling, man. <laughs> <laughs> And so, so if, and, and if I'm struggling, then I know, you know, I've, and I've studied for, for a wee while, but I, I know, and I, so we all know, we all know, like you and doing your master's, just coming through your master's and now, you know, moving on to your PhD, and we, we all know that to struggle, to, to study takes something, to learn takes, takes something, and I, I think um, to get the experience to be able to work, to learn about yourself, I think it's a huge important factor to be able to develop your resilience, to be able to um, to be able to manage your time, you know, work with your time management, to be able to, um, uh, to be able to develop yourself as, as a learner, and uh, yeah, and then eventually maybe even a, a teacher, um, because eventually if you, we, we have that sort of kind of uh, planner model, you know, that, that, that big mentor, um, big brother, little brother kind of model, and, and we know that that sort of kind of um, role is, is hugely important not just for teaching, but for learning as well. You know, when, when you become a teacher, you can learn so much more because it's instilled so much more deeply in your experiences. Uh, I, mean, I, I agree. I mean, well, we, we share a similar philosophy and that's why we're, we're part of the same, the same school. But it, you're absolutely right. I, I mean, just this morning, um, I, I still have a live group chat with two of the boys that we went overseas on a, on a learning experience a couple of years ago. And, and, you, and that tour kind of model, model that you're talking about, it's still there um, in regards to the continuous learning, even though they've left our space. Um, there's still that sharing uh, where I'm learning from them as what I would be called the mentor, but they're still learning from, from me in, in, the, in those exchanges. And, and that's, that's quite strong. And, and, I, and I really enjoy that about our, our, our teaching approach that, that we do it. I, I particularly, and because I'm a strong advocate for what we do in terms of um, sport education, I, I feel, even though Mintzberg, uh, Henry Mintzberg in the, in the, in the management uh, realm spoke about the importance of managers learning from experience rather than going and doing MBAs. Uh, but I think we have a stronger uh, possibility in, in, our, in our sport education to providing a more of an experience-based uh, education. Um, and I know you're, you're a strong advocate and you're, you're actually quite hands-on on, on doing this. Can, can you tell us a little bit about, more about how what kind of experiences you generate um, to enhance that learning, enhance those leadership skills with students? Yeah, okay, so uh, probably this probably when we move into the uh, space of outdoor education as well, right? Like we, um, and you, um, 
yeah, so, I mean, there's, there's, there's roles there of adapting, um, of adapting your, your teaching into a more of a practical sense, so it becomes more of a realistic kind of front line, you know, so, so for, for people to be able to reflect on. And inside, um, yeah, so on top one of the papers that I, that I run, that I'm, I'm really passionate about, I'm really excited about, is the outcome education space, you know, and, uh, because, um, because it's, it's hugely empowering to be able to see these students that, that, that have no concept of um, the outdoors and no, even no, no inclination to even be, you know, to pick it up as a, as a career. And that's, and that's fine. But, um, but I, I, te I teach this, this paper on outdoor education because um, what I see in students, I see the development of their, um, them being able to learn um, by, by doing a lot of experiences, you know, so we, and because we, inside the outdoor, outdoor space, we teach, um, we teach a lot of soft skills, like leadership skills, um, to be able to um, enhance their learning by, you know, even by going into the bush, you can take their classroom, uh, take their classroom environment out into the outdoors, and it becomes a different environment, it becomes a teaching environment that doesn't have any walls, it doesn't have any um, any, any um, you know, any four walls and a roof, it has a, you know, you, you got, you got a bush, and you got this cool learning environment. And what can you do? You know, and inside the bush, I mean, I'll teach, I'll teach um, nutrition in the bush. Yeah. One of my papers that I teach as well is, is nutrition. I'll go into the bush and go, man, cool, look at this, man. This is a calico. This is for you know, medicinal purposes. The Māori used to take this, you know, and and, and use this as, as Māori medicine. And so. And when we learn about trees, we learn about the bush, we learn about some survival skills. Um, and you know, it's really cool. It's just seeing the, you know, some of their, their, their light bulbs coming off and the students going, wow, man, this is cool. You know, and then, and then what's, what's also really, really uh, special to me too, is that um, even years after I get photos and Facebook photos of students taking their kids to these places too, you know, and they be able to be there. So then they, therefore they become a mentor for these students even though they want to be something completely different in, the, in, in, in their career. Um, like not a lot of our students may not even come through and be outdoor instructors. We've had a few, um, but, but, you know, the, the outdoor environment is something that I think it's, um, it's really cool. And I think just the, just the ability to be able to um, implement some scenario-based learning. Um, in my, when I was doing sport management, we were, to, we were talking about, we are talking about, um, the, uh, the the planning, you know, leading, organizing, controlling the model, you know, you know, yeah, the, yeah. The, the, the flock and, you know, in, in terms of uh, the four functions of management. Um, it was it was cool to take some of those outdoor kind of activities and bring them into the classroom. And then we created this cool scenario where they had to, you know, make this, get this egg and they had to make the capture around this egg and then they drop it from a pipe, you know, and then, yeah. and then what did it come from? Yeah, it was a, it was a cool learning environment, but by a fun activity, and then in reflection, because reflection is a huge part of the learning as well. Is that what did we do? Okay, for, for them, it might have been um, without the reflection, it becomes all we've done is made this capture on the egg and drop it and then we get smashed. Um, or, or not. Okay, but, but with the reflection, it became like, man, this is what we've done. We, we plan the activity first. We, you know, we, we, we organize the resources to, to go into making this. We, um, there was a leader amongst the group who was the leader and we had the conversation around the issue around there too. And then right at the end we controlled it by by reflecting on that activity. So 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 you can like there's plenty of cool activities that you can that you can take in terms of the outdoor space and bring them into the classrooms where you don't have to worry about the four walls. It doesn't have to be a whiteboard in front of the room, right? It yeah. doesn't have to be a PowerPoint in front of the in front of the room for you to learn stuff. Um, encourage Dialogue between groups and sit back, and and I think I think it's really cool. Inspiring. Uh, think think about what I enjoy about leadership too. I enjoy just sit, creating a scene and then sitting back and then watching cool things happen. Sometimes, um, of course, it doesn't always happen like that. Sometimes you need to step up and kind of push people along. But yeah. it's cool to be able to create the environment, be able to sit back and 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 then watch cool things happen amongst the group, and then get the reflection, and then go cool, and then they go, man, that was an awesome part where really all you've done is really create a scene for it. And then, you know, and, and then if, if the scene's right, then the, the learning happens in terms of any space. Now, this is really interesting to, have, to to listen to. I mean, we talk about it all the time, but I can imagine for our listeners because we're coming from a tertiary setting. 
And 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 we're in a tertiary setting because we work in this field of sport education. We're talking so strongly about that scenario-based learning, that experiential based learning where we're setting the scene and we're letting a lot of reflection take come into to play in regards to the learning but at the end i think what the key here that we want to try to highlight is the whole concept of those development of soft skills that are mm -hmm. transferable to different types of vocations moving forward because um, by creating those scenes, by taking them to the outdoors, and like you say, I, I completely agree with you, outdoors might not be the career, you know, an outdoor instructor might not be the career, but the experience of going through outdoor education can develop such a strong set of soft skills that will be completely transferable to so many different other uh, vocations that they can carry forward. Um, and I completely agree with you with um, that whole set of that planning execution and reflection or, or, or looking at it from the point of view of the, the, the four functions of management. Um, it, it, the outdoor education allows you to do all that. Um, it allows you to create a real laboratory in the outdoors uh, where you're actually putting now humans to develop and explore the, those soft skills. Yeah, that's what I love, right? Eh? Human labyrinths. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm not sure that sounds really good, but 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 that's it's 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 incredible, and I think many times when people look at our, at um, at education and and that strong value of that sport education, um, it's seen as fun and games, um, and, yeah, a lot, yeah, and, and, a, and a lot of people that come into our into our terrain here are thinking, oh, I want to study sports, kids, fun and games, but the added self knowledge and and soft skills is tremendous. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's huge. And well, I think it comes back to that what I was saying before about learning about yourself and um, and and who you are as a person, like learning about your identity, which is which is hugely important, you know, for um, for especially for people for kids who don't get time to reflect on who they are. And you know, even thinking back to the classroom, we know, we know our older older adults are, you know, very more, much more reflective than kids because kids don't reflect, they don't, they don't have the, they don't develop the skills to reflect until you later on, unless you've been kind of, you know, unless that's a part of your co for at school or part of your education at school. And um, and it doesn't seem to be, um, there's not a huge lot of reflection going on by teenagers. So we, we find, you know, and, and unless that, that environment's been necessarily purposely created for them. You know, in, in the outdoor space, what I, what I enjoy is that um, there's a, you know, we all heard of that comfort zone, right? Yeah. Like we're all sitting in our comfort zone. It's, it's a nice, comfortable place to be. You, you put someone in the outdoors, straight away, you're, you're kind of pushing environments where the people are going, ah, well, I've, I've never been in this place before. Like, you know, like we'll, we'll take students down to Hanula, which is like a 20 minute drive, still in Auckland. And we've got students going, ah, oh, I've never been out of Auckland before. But it's still, yeah. we're still in the same city because the students are so, um, um, some some people just don't have haven't had the opportunity or the, the opportunity to get out into the bush and be able to try things. It's it's um, for for lack of for for many reasons, you know. So um, so the cool thing about the outdoors is that we get the the chance to push people into their um, into their what's what's called their their um, stretch zone, you know. Yeah. So we've got a comfort zone. And then we've got the stretch zone. So the stretch zone is really cool because the stretch zone, stretch zone is people stepping out of their out of their comfort zone. And for some people, this might be to sit in the kayak. It might be way out of the comfort zone. Yeah. For some people, it might be to hit the big waves in the kayak. Mm. That might be a little bit more out of their comfort zone, right? So, so if we get the chance to be able to put people in their comfort zone, regardless of where that is, and, and it's my job as an educator in the outdoors to be able to find what it is for a lot of people and be able to offer experiences that accommodate that in a safe space um, to get people to experience that then we get them then they get the chance to learn more about themselves in a different space and a, in a different environment they come away so empowered man like, like okay. just to just to kind of walk away from an experience to to, to go far out that was awesome you know and, and uh, that was a cool that was a cool experience or Oh man, I, I didn't know I could do that. I, man, I'm so proud of myself. You know, and that, that's that's really cool thing to hear. Um, and um, and I think once once people get into that 
um, they'll have the opportunity to be able to learn more about themselves. I think that's when some cool stuff happens, right? And especially in their stretch zone. Um, beyond the stretch zone, that ugly panic zone, right? Like people, people, you know, get into that panic zone where they, you know, they they reach um, lengths way beyond their confidence. And it might some people might be the fitness level, there might be um, the skill levels or or whatever. So. Um, my, my job, my role would be to really put them in their, in their safe space where they learn about themselves, learn about the outdoors, get a good experience, good, some good education, and, and develop these soft skills that we've been speaking about. You know, the leadership, the resilience, the communication, the confidence, um, the identity, the empathy, you know, all, all those cool, cool um, you know, cool things that we can we can replicate in the outdoors by putting people in group situations, by putting people in problem solving situations where they have to, um, you know, where they have to come up with a, a decision to make something or, or to do something, you know. And then my role from there, if I set the scene, is to step back, yeah, you know, let, let them do it, let them have their space, let them work amongst their their own in their own space and then their own you know groups to be able to develop something cool. And in, in, in that sense, especially these past two years, uh, whether it's us, especially here in New Zealand um, during the second semester in this year, but in other parts of the world all through 2020, um, what you're explaining and, and setting these scenes and being able to get these experiential learnings and, um, and these soft skills through learning has been absolutely challenged through lockdowns and COVID. Um, and one of the things in, in, in the conversations I've been having is that uh, when we're reconnecting with education, it's all been it's all been about academics and academic compliance, uh, fulfilling the the assessment requirements, having students complete the compliance bit of education, and the compliance bit of education is that black and white side of education, and it's not covering that social, emotional, reflective. Uh, learning necessarily or those environments that are social and emotional that education has which we, you're talking about that stretch zone um, that's been left aside a bit in regards to uh, education in, in the current COVID um, situations learning that from the, the experience over the past two years um, where do you think we need to go in terms of education in terms of being able to continue to generate the, those soft skills in a changing environment, in an environment now that um, students know that the black and white compliance side of academics and learning uh, can be fulfilled online, which is what we've experienced, but understanding that higher value of the soft skills that can be achieved through the experiential. Um, how, how do we blend it all together? I mean, I'm not sure if you've thought about it. Uh, we haven't conversed to this before, but uh, this is something I've been dwelling about uh, quite a bit over the past few weeks in regards to, we've taken away that social aspect. We've taken away that aspect of, you know what, let's muck around in the classroom uh, because that's fun. And there's some learning, experiential learning that comes out of that, or that scene that you're setting uh, as, a, as a lecturer for students for them to trial and explore and get the soft learning from there that's been taken away that um that social interaction yeah it sure is, sure is. yeah and, and it may like, the reality of it is we, we're in the space that we are now and um and it's there's no getting out of it until we're allowed to be back out of space so you're right the social aspects gone the assessment stuff is priority number one at this stage which doesn't give off of the same soft skill development there you'd find in the outdoors, and it's 100%, 100% true. Um, what that would look like in the space in terms of developing, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a hard one to come up with, but I, I think a lot of, the, a lot of the, the learning can still, can still come to a, a point of fruition, at, at, you know, up to, up to a certain level. I think, um, I think maybe with the development of like a virtual space or, um, or um, trying to be put out of your comfort zone and in, in, um, in, in your own in your own realm, but I think it's a yeah, it, it, it's a it's kind of a hard one to kind of determine where this could possibly end up. I, I think I, I think um, creating scenarios um, to put people into um, give them the space to be able to develop themselves is uh, probably um, the more um, space that we can we can go. But it, it's a kind of a um, it, you can you can maybe look at the um, 
Yeah, I suppose I suppose looking at looking at the reflection tools um, to be able to look at some stuff that, that happened in the in the past to be able to reflect on that, that might give people a sense of, of how to develop that moving forward. Yeah, it's a it's a hard one to it's a hard one to go on. Unfortunately, my outdoor paper doesn't run this semester, so I haven't had to haven't had to kind of work on the development of uh, of the, the soft skill development <laughs> outside in this in this environment. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, that's, that's actually been real lucky to tell you the truth because it is it is hard. I mean, because um, it, education, especially this this semester, has been pushed more to an isolated individual approach, an individual reflection, um, rather than that connection with with others. Um, I suppose maybe just the uh, doing things by analogy. You know, it's like okay, um, Daz, you went out for a for a walk around your uh, reserve close to your house. And I did mine, uh, what did you see? It was more of, a, of, of an analogy kind of thing. But, um, mm -hmm. but again, um, it's different. Uh, it's different and, and that's, I guess, the, the challenge from our, from our educational perspective to, to try to continue to deliver yeah. and, uh, and, and promote that same personal development um, uh, within the changing space. And, I, and I've seen, and we've, what we've seen through um, through the lockdown and, and um, in, in this environment too, we've seen IT stepping up and um, bridging more of their, their gap to be able to um, become more proficient in terms of creating more realistic kind of roles as well. You know, so maybe the, the space of like a virtual reality or something like that. So, you know, for, for those who have access to um, to technology like that, who who knows? There might be where we, we could be um looking in the future but yeah i think it's more more at the stage would be more of a what do you do in reflection type type tools that can maybe help develop some of that until we get out of the space and we're back into the real world right I'll, I'll, i'm now i'm actually going to do a call out for any buddy in the technology industry that might be listening to this, because I think you just hit on something really cool, um, creating some kind of virtual reality tool to replicate. Uh, like, remember like those, uh, those storybooks that we would read when we were kids that you could actually choose the endings. So if you think this is going to happen, you go to page 24. Oh, nice. and, and if you think this is going to happen, go to page 28. And you kept on changing the way that the book was finishing. So yeah. Imagine having a tool like that for um, experiential um, a, a learning experiences through a, through a virtual reality, especially in that outdoor space would be, uh, be cool. that would be very cool. Very, very cool. And in and, and the way that we're going, I mean, it would be really cool to get the connection from a technology space to actually be able to do something like that. Yeah, yeah. Well, you see technology is coming more to the front, right? And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a big thing. And you see like uh, platforms, different platforms stepping up, and, you know, bridge the gap in this new world. Who, who knows how long this is going to go on for and uh, when it's going to be back, to be honest. Yeah. And, and it also, I mean, like you say, it, it does bring the, the world a whole lot closer. Up until a few years ago, I mean, we were just a flight away from going anywhere and discovering, like, you your experience through Camp America um, mm -hmm. just give you a different horizon. But um, probably now we need to bridge that gap looking at, di at different tools and technology could be um, a, a huge, a huge advancement. Um, from that point of view, um, You've been around the education space for a while. Um, I'll just in in regards to developing skills of our athletes and talk, looking at technology, um, where where do you think have been the major shifts in terms of our of our student learning in regards to technology over these over these years and and that incorporation of technology into our sports space? And I know you you're working more, mostly on the outdoors, but even in that space, hey, where that that shift has been? Yeah, yeah, tech, well, technology has been huge in our industry, right? Um, like we've seen, we've seen changes in sport and sport fields, um, in the professional game to, to um, sport analysis and um, in that, that era as well. We've seen um, more shift in terms of uh, GPS um, movement with, with sport. And um, in, in terms of the, the teaching space, we've seen uh, more platforms like uh, like the Dartfish, um, the uh, a game breaker and those kind of tools coming to fore to, to help and analyze the, the game. And um, now we've seen, um, you know, everything on TV, we're, we're closer to the action. Like this morning, I've got up, I got up because I couldn't sleep at 5 o'clock this morning to watch the second part of the cricket, right? And you can hear everything. You can, you can, uh, you know, if the, if the, the batter cough, you'll be able to hear it. Like you feel like you're so close to 
the action. You know, in West America, it's tough to feel like you're on the boat. You know, almost uh, like you, you know. So I think, well, technology, technology is huge, and it's it's been uh, it's been a big drive for many industries to be able to bring us us closer to the to the game to make us feel like part of the you know like the investment because we ever an investment sport for for a reason and uh, it's, it's, it's an ent entertainment package 100% um, the recreation side of things you know it's, it's like what's in it for me and and, um, and I think we as a consumer of recreational sport we, we all after you know what's in it for me how can I get value for money and, and I think technology is a big way of bringing us closer to that um, you know the way that whether it's um, whether it's an online platform to be able to watch it on TV or, or GPS to make it, you know, to be able to analyze the games a bit more, whether it's even a, um, you know, even it's a, a, a time watch to be able to assess, you know, how fast you can run or, um, you know, technology is, technology is a, a massive, massive thing in the, in the industry of, of sport and recreation and exercise. Um, because I think people want to see more, value for money in terms of what they can get out of it. You go to the gyms now and you can see, you know, all the, all the machines now or electronic, there's all, you know, everything's monitoring everything, you know, so, um, you, you know, you've got entertainment on, on, on the wall and, and um, you got the boot classes, you know, classes of boot camps that are, that are operating all the time. And um, I, I think, yeah, so I think technology is a, a huge push for, um, in this industry, and, and it's, a, it's a big thing of being, being, being able to make us feel closer to the action. But yeah, so I think it's a, I think it's a, it's a big one. And, and it's important as well for, um, for us to connect our, our students um, to this technology and that curiosity of, uh, of, yeah. of the use and the, and the new possible technology that they, can, that they could access to create that, what you're explaining to us, that closeness to that to that activity um and, and that's and i think and that's a, a really cool discovery space especially from our applied education point of view um uh, how understanding how we want to be and how people want to be closer to the sport uh whether it's from that recreational space the competition space um how that can just spike the curiosity and you don't know what students we have today what they might be uh, working on or developing it, uh, developing or working with in five, six years time because of that mm -hmm. curiosity that it generated of understanding how technology brings us closer to the action at the end of the day. Yeah, yeah, exactly right, exactly right. Um, yeah, no, so I think I think it's uh, like plus for students, it's, it's massive, you know, like technology to be able to, um, you know, develop like programs like uh, Zoom and Teams, you know, to be able to, um, well, one thing, one thing lockdown has taught us I think is that um, you know there's there's industries that can probably potentially not have to go back to the office. They can literally survive, if not thrive, in an online environment. So yeah. um, you know, and this, and this environment's given us a chance to be able to look at that. And 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 the sports for the sports industry has done exactly the same because um, I know I know groups that have set up platform online platforms and they're still operating from last year's lockdown and they're still going and they're building these big enterprises because they're developing. Um, online um, wake up calls and, and they're doing um, Zoom classes, you know, two or three times a day. Yeah. Um, and then gaining membership that way. So the industry is, yeah, the industry is changing, but changed. And I think, I think as, a, as an industry, we have to be in a, a position to be able to be ready to adapt to that change. Because what, one of the questions that was coming out last night was like, oh, cool. So where do we go from here with the industry? And it's like, Wow, man, we, we don't even know what an industry is going to look like at this stage until we come out of lockdown. Now, there was a question last year, right? Until we yeah. done a lot, a lot of reflection to decide where we, where, where we're going with this. Um, and then it was a case of, cool, how, how do we adapt to this? How do we prepare our students to be able to adapt to this changing environment and climate? Because we don't, we really didn't know where you know where things were heading, and we can't wait for students to be able to go. Oh, I'll wait till the the gym's open before I start my work experience now, right? Because your gym may not open. Exactly. And that's the reality of it, right? Exactly. Because people are changing. People, you know, the environment might be changing. And it's, uh, yeah, I think we just have to be ready to adapt to that. Yeah, I, I even see, I've seen that in the in the coaching space. Um, coaching, I mean, many times you have those review sessions in, uh, in coaching in the team environments. Well, you don't necessarily have to have them, those review sessions anymore 
in a in a common room. You could just have them in the same space that we're talking uh, today, and 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 those barriers have actually come down. That we we could probably do a lot more things online now as a general population. Um, after these last couple of years, and and that's been on the enhancement of uh, of technology, and and you know, like you're saying, uh, the that that training space has has really benefited in terms of uh, overhead costs, to tell you the truth, uh, thanks uh, thanks to the um, thanks to the the pandemic. So it is it is a change. It is definitely a changing environment, um, a changing environment that I, I like. We were talking at the beginning of the conversation that understanding the experiences, understanding the, 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 the options that are in front of you better allows you to be a little bit more better prepared to take on whatever opportunities come on in, in the future. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. There's, um, yeah, and I, I, think, um, I think understanding your, your, the opportunities where you're gonna go. And, and you know, the thing is about the sports industry is that it's changing so much. You can develop, you know, I think I alluded to it a little while ago, is that you can develop a lot of the soft skills that go into the industry. And, and to be honest, a lot of people get into the industry and don't have no idea where they want to go. No idea. But they know it's in the sport area. They know it's in the sport environment. They know it's great for people. They know it's not in the office. Um, and they just want to make a career out of it, which is which is fantastic. Well, you know, we, and we've seen students going straight from our degree into work experience and going, oh, yeah. I have yeah. no idea this is even here. You know, like this, this is a this is an opportunity that, that I've got to capitalize on. And we've, you know, we, we've seen students going into that um that game uh, da, um, video analysis space. So they, yeah. they, they have no idea what's out there to get them. So yeah, I think I think this has given us the opportunity to kind of think about what you know what's out there to be able to develop, give, give students the opportunity to see what's out there by exposing them to um, different facets of the industry. And it's a and, and that's why that's why we've been so um, instrumental in terms of developing programs that are going to cover as much of the industry as possible, to be honest, um, because we, we know, and we've always been like that in terms of philosophy at, at MIT, is about um, what, what, what are students wanting to see um, and what can we offer them, you know, chance to, and then we started way back from our certificate, you know, years ago, we, we just gave literally a small support of the industry, and those yeah. students would go far out. I wanted to be a personal trainer, but now I want to get into the outdoors. Or oh, I want I don't I want to get in the outdoors, but now man, now it's cool, but I also love coaching. Yeah. You know, so yeah, so yeah, yeah. if we can if we can provide the space for for people to get into the even if you had no idea that you want to get into the sports industry, to be able to sit into the program and, and keep your eyes open, there's of opportunity out there. Um and, and there's plenty of branches that come off the industry that, that are bracketed in the sport recreation and exercise and outdoors industry. Um, and they, they all require the same skills or yep. similar skills, you know, the similar soft skills um, beyond the technical expertise of, you know, this, this comes with each one. I, I, I agree. Well, well, we're all very strong advocates of, uh, of the transferable skills that you get to do the, the practical nature of uh, sports education. And, and again, in, in, in our philosophy at uh, MIT at the School of Sport um, is, is quite strong in regards to enhancing the, that, ex, that practical experience nature of, of the learning, uh, whether it is through our direct contact with the students um, in, in, in our classroom environments or, or our teaching environments, or is it through the connections through industry stakeholders that can help provide that, those experiences uh, for, for the students. Um, I think we were seeing something this morning, which looks to be very, very exciting for 2022 in regards to um, generating a new space and a growing space, and uh, especially with mm -hmm. um, a push to more equality and inclusion of people with different capacities. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great new avenue for our own students to, to experience. Yeah, yeah, agree. Yeah. Um, and to be able to kind of have that space with um, yeah, to be able to develop their learning is, is awesome. Um, Des, plans, expectations for next year. Oh, cool. Um, get through this year. Get through this. <laughs> <laughs> That's my plan. That's my plan. But for next year, um, uh, I want to. Um, I, I really want to get this um, outdoor program off the. Off 
um, to, to be able to develop it to, a, to the next level. I want to create new networks with industries. Um, I want to, um, I want to, so I'm, I'm in my second year of my Tereo study. Well, like I, I've always wanted to learn Tereo, right? <laughs> I've always wanted to learn um, how to speak my, my unfortunately, my mum, because my mum's from Tahiti, um, which is up north. My dad's from, uh, well, I think he's from Taranaki. He's one of those. We're not really too sure. He's one of those lost nineties. Um, but we're still we're tracking him down. But um, but I've always I've always felt strong roots to my Māori side, and I've always wanted to speak. So I'm in my second year studies, my third year. Uh, hopefully, my fingers crossed, I'll get into the third year studies next year. But that'll really come down to whether I can, um, yeah, we, we can get through this um, this year. So that, that's my my plan. My um, yeah, to do my PD because. Um, yeah, so I've always wanted to kind of develop that into the next level. Um, yeah, and um, my um, yeah, my plan is to be involved in more into my son's schooling, um, into a certain capacity, and get on some committees and around schools and stuff like that. Because I've I've spent a lot of time uh, being really selfish and looking after my own studies, so <laughs> I'm going to put something back into my kids. <laughs> fair, fair, fair enough. Fair enough. I'm excited. I'm, 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 I'm really excited. Well, I've been seeing your um, Tadeo journey over the past couple of years, and and that's that's really exciting. And you know, it rubs off. And I, I get bugged here at home. You know, I have no Maori background, but um, but I use uh, Maori terminology in my everyday speech uh, uh, mm -hmm. around around Kai and Fano, and 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 sometimes I get bugged by my own kids because they go like, "Where are you coming from? You you got no Maori in you." But it's just I, I think it just rubs off because of the environment that we're in, and I think that your influence of your journey actually has rubbed off a bit on me in regards that you you started to use more Tadeo in your um in, in your everyday which is which is cool uh, which is re really really cool i'm really oh, also nice. i'm really also excited to um, to see um the next st stage of growth in the outdoor education space for uh for for your cohorts um uh, i think there's a there's a huge huge opportunity in regards to leadership i'll call it leadership training i'm not sure if you're comfortable with that but in regards to leadership training for the next generation of uh tertiary students especially for us at um medical institute technology um i i, I, I'm, I would be i'm really excited i'm really tempted to see how that all is going to turn out um, moving into 2022, 2023, uh, with regards to the growth of leadership training through outdoors education uh, at MIT. Um, I, I'm really excited to see how that turns out because I believe in it and I, I know that you do it with tremendous passion and you get such tremendous results of growth and, and soft skills and, and personal development from, from the students. So um, Daryl, it's been an absolute pleasure to have kind of a formalish conversation our conversations are usually not this formal as today yeah, man, man. <laughs> uh, um, but it's been it's been, <laughs> it's been awesome to have a conversation on, on a little bit more concise topics than uh than our usual kind of muck around fluff conversations that end up being very deep but um but uh, a little bit more casual so thanks a lot for coming on coming on board this uh the paddock this week oh you're welcome friend that's cool thanks for having me man well, if anybody wants to get in touch with Daryl at uh, Medical Institute Technology School of Sports, or if you're interested in outdoor education and how to, how to implement it, how to get the most growth out of your own students, um, if you're a student yourself and you want to find out more, or you're an MIT student and you want to find out more about how you can actually get this growth, this leadership growth and this leadership training through outdoor education, uh, contact Daryl. His email is right below, his, right below him. Just send him an email. He'll be happy to answer um, with regards to outdoor education, leadership, and um, and educational leadership altogether. Um, please subscribe, like, share, do all that fun stuff with this podcast. Uh, we'll be back next week with another interesting conversation from the field of sport education um, and, and, and leadership um, on the paddock. So please share, like, subscribe, do all that fun stuff, and we'll see you next week. Take care, guys.